Welcome back, I'm Bill. This is a Petromax Rapid Model 828. It is a 350 candle power kerosene lantern. The Petromax lanterns were made in Germany. Um, they came in a number of varieties. There, this was an 828, which was 350 candle power. There was a Model 829, which was otherwise exactly the same, but was 500 candle power. Uh, once we get into this, I can show you the difference. Uh, and we'll be giving this guy an upgrade as we go along. Uh, there was an 827, which was the 250 candle power. And I know now these days they also make a 150 candle power model. I'm not sure if they did back then or not. Uh, the difference between the 250 and then the 350 and the 500 uh, candle power was simply the size of the, the lantern. The 350 and the 500 are this size. The 250 is considerably smaller. Um, Petromax is an interesting company. Uh, here in North America, when you think of a camping lantern, the name Coleman is synonymous. In most of the rest of the world, that's not true. In most of the rest of the world, it's Petromax. Uh, the company started with uh, Alfred Gretz, that's G-R-A-E-T-Z, um, in 1865. Kerosene was kind of a new thing and he decided to start a company making lamps that ran on kerosene. And he did that for a good half, a, half of a century. Uh, then his son, Max, came along and Max had a better idea. Uh, he wanted to make a lantern that ran under pressure, that also ran on kerosene. And starting in 1910, he began work on what would become the Petromax lantern. Uh, the name Petromax, by the way, uh, was thought up by his friends. He had an entirely different idea for a name, but his friends uh, called him Petromax for Max and Petrol. Uh, and the lantern ended up taking that name. So that's where the name comes from. Uh, they had a factory in Berlin. Uh, they went in production with earlier versions of this that essentially functioned the same way in 1920. Um, they're not changed very much. The single biggest change, as I understand, was around 1935 or 1936. Uh, Petromax uh, came up with the rapid preheater. Uh, this is, uh, th these vary in design over the years uh, based on the patent information this one, this design was used about 1955 to 1957, which helps date this. Also, the dating on these is, is um, kind of all over the place. Um, sometimes you have to date them by various features that changed over the years. Uh, at various points in time, they had date codes stamped or scratched on the bottom. This has none of that. Uh, and I've been told that that sort of probably indicates it was made in 1957. Um, the preheater style changed um, in, in a few years after this, uh, but it still functions essentially the same way. Um, and so early models have a preheat cup uh, that you would put alcohol or spirits in, just like a Coleman kerosene lantern, uh, and it sits down at the base of the generator, or in this case they would call it the carburetor. Um, you can retrofit these with that, and I think the current models actually come with a preheat cup as well. Uh, but what this is really designed for, and hopefully we'll get it running and you can see it later, uh, is this rapid preheater. So you add pressure to the fount. Uh, when you've got it pumped up, you flip this open after applying a match, and there's a little jet in here, and it shoots kerosene and air from the fount uh, up into the into the lantern and this it's a jet of flame kind of like a blowtorch and it preheats the, the the generator the carburetor and then once it's hot you close that uh, and just before you close it you turn the valve and open it um, the valve on these is a bit different than on a coleman um, and we'll show you that as well um, so yeah uh, that was the main change in the mid 30s but since then the lanterns are essentially unchanged there's small stylistic differences um, there are clones made all over the place. There are a number of different versions you'll find made by European manufacturers. Um, what happened was uh, Petromax made these uh, up until World War II and then they had to stop production for a while. Uh, the plant was in Berlin, so it was taken over by the Soviets. And for a few years after the war, uh, under Soviet direction, they continued to make Petromax lanterns. I expect if you can find one of those, they're pretty valuable. 
Um, and uh, Max Gretz was forced to go elsewhere and eventually he had to get public funding uh, um, and, and opened a factory in Westphalia um, and they were made there I think until the 1970s uh, and same lanterns. Um, they also had a competitor named Aida and Aida started making these eventually Petromax bought them out. Uh, so the Aida lanterns are essentially identical. Um, they're the same build quality. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, they were contracted out to a Portuguese company called Hippolito. Uh, they're also excellent build quality and ident identical to the Petromax models. Um, there are clones made everywhere, India, um, Asia, uh, China, uh, varying qualities, some of them good, some of them not so great. Um, I've played with a few of them, uh, Butterfly and Wenzel, and I don't recommend them. The build quality just isn't there. Um, you can get them working, but they're very finicky and, and like I said, the build quality isn't the same. Um, so the current ones uh, use a different model number. On the old ones, you can tell the difference. Uh, the, the main difference is whether they have a rapid preheater or just a preheat cup, and that's reflected in the model number. Uh, the new ones are simply referred to as HK150, HK250, HK350, HK500. Um, the really neat thing with these is that the parts have not changed other than, like I said, a few design things with the, you know, the cutouts and the vent and things like that. Um, and because of that, every single part on this lantern, with one exception that I can think of, uh, is still available. Uh, you can buy them from Petromax. Uh, or a, you know, a number of other outlets. There are quite a few places in Europe. North America, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, you can find these parts on eBay. Uh, the two places I know of in the US that sell them are Layman's and Imperial Lighting. I'm not aware of any place in Canada that does, but I could be wrong. And if you know of that, feel free to put something in the comments. Um, if you're gonna work on one of these, uh, what I really strongly recommend is go on the internet. Um, I bought this from Imperial Lighting in the States. Uh, for about $40, you can buy a rebuild kit, and it will include everything you need um, to do that. It's got washers, it's got um, seals, pips, uh, a, a new nozzle, let's say call it, uh, the burner, um, and other parts are available as well. As you'll see when we get into this, the J-tube and the mixing chamber on this were uh, completely toast. Um, so I've got replacements for that. Uh, the only part I can't find is on the manometer, there's a little tiny screw that holds it together. It's tiny and it's short. Uh, you can buy a, a whole new manometer, but that one little screw uh, you don't seem to be able to buy and I haven't been able to find one locally, but again, I live in a small town on an island and even our, our fastener specialist uh, is somewhat limited. So um, yeah, I debated whether or not to make a video on this. I've had it sitting around for quite a while. Um, I bought it from a guy who had it hanging in his shed for many years. Uh, I don't know how much he tinkered with it. I know he did a little bit. Uh, he said the person who had it before him tinkered with it a lot and tried to get it going and didn't have any luck. Uh, and I can see that it's got, um, in, where, where there should be proper seals, it's got Teflon tape where it had Teflon tape wrapped around it in all sorts of different places. Uh, the graphite packing is shot. Uh, the, the lead where the preheater screws in and the valve screw in, they use these lead seals and you can see I've already been in there and I've, I've been fiddling with this for a bit, uh, but the lead seals are, are completely shot. These are really a one-time use thing and someone's taken it apart many times and tightened it down and there's almost nothing left on the bottom. It's all, in fact, on this one, there is nothing left on the bottom. It's all squished out on the side. So that's no good, but we've got new lead seals in our repair kit. Um, the, the one thing I have already done, you may be able to tell the top is polished and that's because when I got it, someone had drilled a hole through the top of the vent. I suspect they did that to try to get into um, the, the J-tube for some reason. Um, and I debated whether or not to fix this or how to fix it. I, was, I don't know anybody to braise it. Um, and so eventually I, I didn't want to spend a fortune on it. Um, I had a friend who could solder it up, but then, and then I could file it down and smooth it out, but I didn't think it would look quite right. Uh, you can see there's a little bit of a black ring here. That's because my solution was to put a brass bolt through there. Um, simple fix, soldered it off, um, sanded it down and polished it. And that's, I, that's 
decent. Um, it's kind of a beat up vent. I don't even know how this is gonna turn out. These are chrome, while I think the fount is nickel uh, and the chrome really hasn't held up well. So this is probably going to be mostly brassy with just a little bit of chrome possibly shining up. I, I will we'll see. Um, so uh, yeah, I've already trying to debate whether or not this was even worth doing anything with. I've had it all apart. Um, and uh, I did decide this last spring I was headed to the States in June. And so I ordered a, a rebuild kit and had it sent to a friend and picked it up while I was down there. So um, let's get into it. Before I start tearing into this, I wanna bring your attention to this document. I will put a link to it down in the comments. It's a PDF file. Uh, in 2008, this fellow uh, Jan Müller in Germany uh, produced a very nice, detailed, and illustrated uh, teardown and rebuild uh, manual, a set of detailed instructions. Uh, and uh, Irvin Schaefer was kind enough to translate it into English. Don't know anything about them, but I found this with Google. Uh, it's not the easiest thing to find. Uh, so again, there will be a link down in the comments, and uh, this is uh, really, uh, I think, invaluable if you read through the whole thing first. Uh, I only differ with him on a couple of points, uh, and that just may be because of some of the quirks of this thing because someone's already torn it apart. So uh, have a look at that. So this comes apart first with these two pins, the bail pins that are threaded. And just holds the vent on. And then we'll take the inner hood. I believe they actually refer to the vent as a hood on this. All the terminology is different from a Coleman. Now, this was something else. Um, when I got this, uh, this screw, somewhere here, uh, this screw uh, had been sheared off. There's a, um, this is for retaining the J-tube uh, and making sure it sits at the right height. Uh, and this was completely seized up. I actually had to drill it out. And since I, I couldn't get the screw from Imperial Lighting, if you order directly from Petromax and want to pay 36 euros for the shipping, uh, you can get a new screw from them. In this case, I've just got a, a brass, I think it's a 1032 screw, um, not metric surprisingly. Uh, and it's just a, a stainless steel screw in there and it'll get the job done for now. Um, the reason this is here is to adjust uh, the gap, the air gap between the J-tube and the generator tip or the jet. Uh, and you need to move the J-tube up and down and this retainer holds it in place uh, to manage the air gap there. And that's where your air mixes with your fuel or, or gets sucked in with the fuel. Um, on these older J-tubes, there's a little butterfly uh, uh, flap in there that's turned with this screw. Uh, and that allows you to fine tune the, the air, although most of the time I'm told it's just left wide open. Uh, the new one does not have that, unfortunately. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> the, the, what they call the mixing chamber screws onto the bottom of the J-tube. Uh, you can actually see just how rotted out this is. Um, the guy I got this from had tried to get it off. In fact, he had even snipped this, there's a like a retainer that holds it in, in the center. He'd snipped this, bent it around, flattened this whole thing back. I've kind of straightened it out. Uh, and I think trying to get in there to, to get a grip on this and turn it off and um, ended up, uh, it was just kind of hanging when I got it. And yeah, you look at it wrong and it just, it fell off. Um, so that's why I've got a new um, mixing chamber, new J-tube. And the nozzles on these, you can see they're actually ceramic and you can buy metal ones, but the standard ones are ceramic and they're sort of a consumable. Uh, they have a limited lifespan, so they need to be replaced periodically. So we'll go ahead and take this out. We're gonna de-rust all these pieces. And that will throw away. So there's our inner hood. The globe, which I think is original. I'm not 100% sure, but I have good reason to think it is. Uh, and now um, 
we need to take this center screw out, which holds the, the center plate in. And that holds the whole burner frame in place. <coughs> and with that off, the whole burner frame comes off. Now, I'm not quite sure. Normally, I dump this whole thing in citric acid. Uh, but I'm not sure how I'm going to go about doing that because I don't want to destroy the, the label it's riveted on and um, I don't want to have to replace those. I don't have the equipment to do that. Uh, so I think we may just put this in upside down right up to there so we can sort of clean up and de-rust this part. So here we go. We've got our pump. This actually has a manometer, a pressure gauge. You need to pump it up to a bar and a half. Uh, before lighting the uh, preheater uh, and you need to keep it pumped up while that's running because it's going to vent pressure pretty quickly uh, and then once it's running uh, you want to shut that off and, and pump it up to two bar and then you can let it run. Oh. Like I said there's supposed to be a little screw in here um, it doesn't really hurt anything for it to be missing. The top just rattles around and in this case because whatever glue originally held the, the window in place is broken, um, when this lifts up it's really easy for that, that window to get shifted around. Um, so this is, our, this is our manometer gasket here. It feels like a hard piece of plastic. I mean it's, it's oh yeah I can just break it in half. So that is completely shot. Oops. We'll set that aside. Take out our pump. And this may be easier said than done. Oh, there we go. Container washer there. Got our pump cup, which actually does work. It's not completely hard, um, but it's not in the greatest of shape either. We've got a replacement in the kit, and then we've got this little dished backer uh, that's cupped toward the cup. Spring cap, and I don't think this will come off anymore. Now, one thing we want to do is there's a check valve down at the bottom here. And if I can get the right lighting, you won't be able to see this. And there's a, it uses a lead seal, which means it's much easier to remove than a Coleman. for this guy in the kit as well, and a new seal for it. And now let's um, take off the, the flame tube for the preheater so that it's not in the way. And now we'll take the, the valve and generator apart. This is our 350 candle power gas jet. It even says 350 on it. Now, I could not find a 350 candle power rebuild kit from any of the places in the US that sell them. So we're gonna give this guy an upgrade uh, and all it consists of is replacing this with a 500 candle power tip and a corresponding needle. Uh, when I rotate this, it goes up uh, and um, actually, the knob's on backwards. It should be pointed down at this point um, because it's off, I believe. 
um, and the needle itself is missing on this. We'll take our now we'll take our generator or carburetor off. Kerosene lanterns or their generators rather are notorious for getting coked up. Uh, kerosene just does that and these are no different. Uh, they're a lot beefier than a Coleman generator and um, aren't really considered disposable. Uh, especially this Preston loop. That's what they call it in English. I don't know what they call it in German, uh, but these are notorious for getting coked up inside and sometimes some heating and quenching is necessary to get them freed up. Uh, but at least this I can see clear through and it's pretty clean in this part. I don't know if someone's already dealt with that or what, uh, but I think we're in good shape with the generator. Um, next we need to take, uh, because this won't rotate out with the preheater in place, we need to take the eccentric stem out. So we'll just take this nut off. It's a little bit awkward. <laughs> Thankfully I already had it loose and the knob comes off. There's a little washer behind there. Uh, I'm going to see how we, if we can clean this up and maybe get some white paint back into those letters and get this back to the right color. Um, our packing nut comes off. It has no packing in it. You can actually see there's a little bit here. There was some packing rope and someone put some Teflon tape on there, but there's absolutely nothing in here anymore. We have a new one with the rebuild kit. We unscrew this bit and that removes, or that allows us to pull out our eccentric stem. You can see there's a little brass nub on here and that interfaces on the connecting rod. Now we can pull this out. It interfaces with this little slot. So as you rotate this, it moves the connecting rod up and down. And this is different than a Coleman lantern, or at least the traditional valves, where you just screw in a valve stem and it screws into a seat and shuts the, the fuel off. Um, this would actually be more like a Coleman Easy Light. Uh, there's, well, we'll take this out and actually I'll show you down at the bottom. Should be a lot more difficult to turn, but the lead seal is shot and I've taken it out. We'll dig into this further, but there's a pip, spring-loaded pip inside here. And right now uh, it's spring-loaded, so it's held up. And if it were in decent shape and, and the rubber weren't hard, it would seal and shut off the fuel supply. What happens is when, when the eccentric stem is turned and that little nub moves down, it push, pushes a notch down and this whole connecting rod moves down just a little tiny bit, a few millimeters. Uh, and that, when it pushes down, opens the, and you can see there was some kerosene still in there. Now, now that I've got air going through, it's letting it leak out into my hand. Um, when you push that down, it opens the valve and kerosene starts flowing. When you turn the eccentric stem the other direction, it moves the connecting rod up. Uh, and it allows that spring to push the pip closed and it shuts off the fuel supply. Uh, when it's up, it also pushes a needle up through the, um, the, the uh, nozzle or the gas tip and that's what cleans it. So we'll take out our connecting rod and it's in two pieces and there is a little nut here. I'm not gonna mess with it. Uh, we're gonna mess with that later. Uh, but that allows us to adjust how much of this thread goes into uh, the lower half of the rod. So that adjusts the needle height to the proper height. Kerosene all over myself. Didn't put on gloves before doing this, of course. And now the preheater, I'll open it up. Um, we've got a replacement pip for that, I think, in the kit. Uh, but the first thing we want to do is take this nozzle off. This is the only part of this lantern I'm a little bit concerned about. I've had this off and I can actually see light and I can poke a, a Coleman cleaning needle through the jet on that. So I know this is clear, but on the actual preheater assembly itself, this is clogged. So we're going to have to figure out how to unclog that. So there's a retaining nut on here. And all of these are, it's funny that the, screw on the top it is a 1032 it's not metric but the and I think a lot of these things are SAE as well but um, the 
what do you call it, the outside diameter or whatever uh, for turning these things are all metric. This uses a nine millimeter wrench. And of course, I don't have any metric wrenches, just sockets. brass nut and that holds this assembly on and this doesn't come apart apart from we can get this little pip out eventually and and this should have a lead seal in it I've taken it out because it was just completely mush uh, and this this has a filter on the bottom we want to clean that and the rest of this is all one piece. This is brazed or soldered in place and we've got two little tiny air holes, one on either side and then there's a, a hole for the kerosene in the tip. That is currently plugged as far as I can tell. So we'll have to get that open. And now the, the bottom of the main valve. Um, Hold this and put a screwdriver on here and that should unscrew. Again, this is all one piece at this point. That's soldered on. And inside here, that wanted to come out. Inside here, and I can see why someone tried to make a make their own pip. <laughs> I don't think that's going to work. There we go. So this is just the, the bottom of the fuel pickup. It's actually got a little filter down here on the bottom that's kind of messed up, but in a place, but that's part of the replacement. Actually, all of this is part of the replacement. Um, this pip is actually, someone tried to replace it, and they, of course, putting a piece of rubber, or whatever that is on here, is going to interfere with the, the movement of the connecting rod. Uh, but also you can see, hopefully, the middle of this is brass. There's a little, cup there and well wrong part of the connecting rod uh, but there's a, a the, the bottom of the connecting rod is designed to actually sit in that little brass seat uh, and then the actual rubber part is around the outside and that seals uh, so yeah just sticking a piece of rubber over the top of that isn't, isn't going to cut it it's actually going to interfere with everything so that's our complete tear down the next thing I want to do is clean out the fount. Uh, no telling what is in there because it's kerosene. Uh, so I'm going to dump some acetone in here and swish it around and dump it out and we'll see what that's like uh, and go from there. All right, some acetone. something you might want to do I suppose before taking all the or opening all of the orifices because now we've got to cover everything up but it doesn't take much with acetone Wow, I am amazed. I expected that to come out brown. It usually does. So that's not half bad. Very little sediment in there. So our fount is good. That's, that's really nice. 
So the next step is uh, cleaning all this stuff with a citric acid solution. Uh, put these things in and we'll also do the fount and the vent. I have a feeling the vent's gonna come out mostly brass uh, and our inner hood as well. Here's our first course of lantern stew. It's in a mild citric acid solution, about a tablespoon to five liters of water. I'm using this citric acid powder that I get at a local beer and wine making supply house. Uh, it's the cheapest way I've found to get it. So I'm going to let the fount stew away for about 20 minutes. It shouldn't take much. Uh, I want it to clean up the top. Uh, the sides have been kept fairly clean. It looks like maybe even they've been scrubbed probably with a Scotch-Brite pad. Uh, it doesn't look uh, scratched enough to be rough steel wool or anything. Um, but I don't want to leave this in too long and I don't want the solution too strong because it could eat the nickel plating off the brass. Um, so I'll see you when we're ready to take this out and move on to the next bit. I'm going to use some 4 aught steel wool and just lightly scrub this down and we'll see how it looks. I'm also going to make sure I rinse all of that citric acid solution off. No need for baking soda or anything like that, it just rinses off. curious is if there's now a date code evident on there and there is not. Sometimes they scratch them in instead of stamping them and it's hard to see when it's dirty. But there's definitely no date code there. So if some folks on the internet are be trusted that would suggest the date is 1957. Apparently that year they didn't date them at all. Now our second course, we've got the vent in there and you can see the top is already starting to lighten a bit. Um, this will probably be mostly or all brass when it comes out because the plating on this is almost completely gone and what little is left is shot, but we'll see what happens. Like I said, <laughs> this has some chrome plating left on it, but most of it's just gonna be brass. Let's rinse this off. just needs to go to the buffing wheel now and I think it'll look pretty good. It'll be brass, the rest the rest won't, but um, a lot of the Petromax lanterns, you can actually buy them plated or all brass. So um, yeah, that'll just be this guy's personality, I guess. All right, let's polish this fount. Um, I'm using a cotton buffing wheel and some white polishing compound. Brand new, so it's probably going to make a mess. It already is. Start out with some very light pressure. Just let the wheel and the polish do its thing.
somebody, some previous owner has tried to polish it before and so the nickel is pretty thin, but uh, there's a few spots where the brass is already showing, so I don't want to push it any further. Go ahead and polish the bottom while we're at it. Add this vent. I think we can make this look pretty good. I wish I had a photo to show you what this looked like when I got it. This thing looked like somebody dropped it on its head. I was trying to decide whether or not it was worth it to do anything with this lantern. I spent quite a bit of time sitting with this thing, fiddling with it and straightening the, the supports for the top part. Let's see if we can't refresh the lettering on this. It should be filled in with some white paint. So try some fingernail polish here. I think we can fill it in. And then once it's dry, be able to wipe off the excess with some acetone. is to get just the right amount on the brush. <laughs> Just let that set and we should be able to just wipe off the excess. I hope. It's time to put this Petromax lantern back together. I think it's turned out pretty well for something that was kind of a beater, very well used and then abused. So we've got basically, apart from the manometer, we've got three systems that we need to put back in place and rebuild in the process. We've got the pump and check valve, uh, the rapid preheater and the valve. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with the, um, the pump, just because this I think is easiest to work on with the check valve when nothing else is sticking out of the fount. So I'll grab our parts here. One thing, I, I planned on filming this, I even tried to film it and it didn't turn out. Um, I really think this was a really uh, nice touch uh, to finish off the restoration, uh, the, the recessed writing uh, on these knobs. I uh, had lost virtually all of its paint on the pump handle, all of it on this. There was a little bit left in the P. 
So uh, this is really easy to do. Take some white paint. I just used some white fingernail polish. Uh, paint it on. Uh, don't overdo it, uh, but make sure it fills it up. Let it dry for 10 minutes or so, and then take some acetone and a paper towel and just wipe, li light, uh, wipe, lightly wipe off the, the excess on the surface, and this is what will be left behind. I think that turned out great, and it'll look great. So we've got our pump handle, a spring, a cap, this backer plate, and this oddly shaped nut here, and we need to put together the check valve. That's what we want. So this is our check valve housing. <clears throat> So let's deal with the check valve first. So we need to rebuild this. Uh, the first thing we need is this pip is hard as a rock. And so we need to replace that. And that will be in our parts kit here. I'm just gonna open this whole thing up and dump it out. There's another bag with our cleaning needle and the pump cup. needle aside just so it doesn't get damaged and putting it up here. Um, so the first thing we want is our lead seal. I've got three different ones here. So I know these two that are the same size are for the valve and the preheater. So this one's got to be for the check valve. This is what the old one looked like that came out. And then we need our tip, which I believe is this guy here. So we'll just pop the old one out of this spring. And we will put the new one into that spring. It'll go. glasses off for this one. There we go. That's on. This has a lot of very small parts. So we'll put this into our check valve housing and close it up. And now we need to tighten that. falling off. And we'll put the lead washer, the gasket on there. And we're good to go. Now, the fun part is always getting these in. So usually, if you drop it in, and usually you can get it to fall in the hole. good. In fact, I can actually see the lead squished out just a little bit around there. So that's our check valve. Now, our pump. Put the, the cap on. This is the one thing that I'm not replacing. Um, this part, uh, it, it's got a, it's, it's designed to hold this lip and there's a part of this lip that's flat, which uh, allows you to unscrew it. And um, this has been worn off or broken or something, but as long as our check valve works, we don't have to worry about the pump sliding out. Make sure this guy is tight. leather on. That's a new 
one. And then this little retainer washer. using three-in-one oil, Neat's foot oil works, um, anything that's not vegetable oil, basically. Notice these European pump cups always seem to be very hard. I've replaced a few on stoves. This is the first on a lantern. And they're always very, very stiff. See that? That's not even the lettuce drawing air in. Let's oil that a bit more. That's better, and it should get better over time. <clears throat> if it doesn't, we'll just add a, a little more oil to it so that you can see it. If we hold it out, then it'll just take some time to break in. Now, let's work on the valve. Uh, Mr. Mueller over here uh, says to do the preheat, the rapid preheater first, um, but I've got a good reason for holding off on that uh, because I want to get the valve adjusted and use this to hold it while we do that and get everything with the valve installed properly and you can't spin the valve in with the, um, with the knob or the stem on it with the preheater in place. So. We've got our valve, um, lower part of the connecting rod, the upper part of the connecting rod, our needle, our stem, I'm not sure what you call that guy, but we've got that guy, and our, our packing, packing nut, our washer for the, for the handle, nut for the handle, and um, I think we're replacing that guy, so we don't need that part. I think that's everything. So the first thing we want to do is take the valve and we want to put the new foot valve on. So we've got the base, it's got a little filter down here in the bottom, and it's got a spring that goes inside, and then it's got this pip. That's way more springy than the old one was. And that seats on the bottom of the, the valve assembly here. This is our fuel shutoff point. We'll just tighten it on there. All right, so that's the bottom of the valve. Now we want to I'm going to go ahead and put this whole thing together for now. And I am pretty sure we're going to need to adjust that nut down. Um, I'm going to slide this in and this 
this notch needs to be facing the opening here. Oh, that's stiff, but I think that's good. There we go. Uh, and now this guy. Now we need our new graphite packing, which is right here. Make sure this isn't too hard to turn. see it going down and up. So I don't want to, I'm not going to put the knob on quite yet, but I need to do put the carburetor on. That faces the opposite direction of the valve wheel. There's a special tool that comes with these for the tip or for the needle. Uh, the needle is actually, it's like a, a triangle shape. And there's a special little wrench for that. And we'll get our orifice here. This needle and this uh, tip are for a um, 500 candle power model. Turn that down. And what we need to do here is see how far the needle sticks out. We want it to project out no more than half to one millimeter. I'm going to lower it just a little bit. One more turn lower. We'll do it.
perfect. It's just sticking up enough that it'll poke it and clean it, but not enough that it'll hang up on anything. All right, so um, now we will go ahead and put the nut on. I assume they must have a special tool for this in the factory. <laughs> so probably, I'm going to do that once it's in here. So we take a, one of our lead washers, put it on there. usually a pessimist, but the pessimist in me wants to add some Permatex thread sealant to that. <laughs> okay. Not there yet. I think that's that looks about right. We're halfway between the two stamps here. I'm going to call that good. It's still a pain, but it's easier. <laughs> There, that's the finicky part. Now, let's get our rapid preheater together. So this was the one thing I was concerned about. Uh, it, it wouldn't pass any uh, fuel or any, well, it wouldn't pass air. It's got a tiny little jet here for fuel and it's got two holes, little tiny holes on either side uh, for air. And the air holes were easy to clear out with a um, quick light cleaning needle, uh, but the, the fuel jet in the middle was clogged up. I couldn't get anything in there. Uh, and um, so I soaked this in carb cleaner overnight and that still didn't clear it up. So I used my propane torch. I didn't heat it red hot. I just heated it until it was good and hot and then quenched it and did that. I did that twice and then used the quick light cleaning needle and it was able to, I was able to clear it up. So, um, we need to put our filter on the bottom. This is the pickup and it's got a little mesh screen and I was sure to get that clean because this thing can clog up very easily. That tiny little jet. Um, and just Screw this guy, there we go, screw this guy in. And there's no particular clocking on this, you just tighten it. Um, until the, it, it's sealed. Um, this was the lead seal that was in there and someone had undone it and like you can see there's, there's nothing left on the bottom, at least the one on the valve. There's a little bit left on the, uh, for it to sit on. This was all squished out to the sides. Um, now we've got our preheat assembly. Uh, the pip for this has already come out. It was actually missing a screw, so in cleaning it fell out. This is the new one. And it's got a little screw on top of it to hold it in place. there. Okay. That's 
sits on top. And then we've got this nut that holds it in place. I think the reason that they say to put the valve in after this is because it leaves you more room to turn the nut. heater and the nozzle. This was clogged as well. This just, I poked it with a quick light cleaning needle and it opened right up. And I sprayed carb cleaner through both of them, as well as boiling them both in citric acid. fuel cap. Um, I'd like to clean this up, but I think it's just worn. So I'm going to leave it as it is. I just wiped it down. Um, I did polish the plastic in there a little bit and I made sure it's aligned properly. This is the one thing. It's missing this little tiny screw here. I tried to find something to replace it and had no luck. And this is like the, I think the, that little screw is the only individual part on this whole thing that Petromax doesn't sell um, all by itself. You have to buy a whole new manometer. So um, the only issue with this being loose is that the plastic window can come loose and get rotated in there and make it difficult to see what's going on. Um, so I, it was originally glued in place, so I just glued it in place. We will pop our gasket in here. go. And now let's put the, we'll put this, put all of this back together. What am I doing wrong here? There we go. Um, our flame tube it just friction fits friction presses on there. Actually, I think I'm going to pinch that a little bit because it's pretty loose. plate or heat shield was pretty rough shape. That and the inner hood, are, they were very rusty. Of course, those are the steel parts. Now the fun part is getting this lined up.
All right. We're good. Okay, let's set that aside and we'll put the, the hood together. The inner hood, rather. So we've got our new J-tube and um, mixing chamber that just screws on. And we've got a new nozzle. And I'll put that on second, once that's all together. And we need our retainer. First thing I'm going to do is get this guy in here. There we go. And then we'll need to squeeze this all. Back together. That's, that's better than it was to start with. And I should point out this screw is a little unique. It's actually got a point on it that fits into the hole here so that it holds this in place. It doesn't just butt up against it. It actually This guy just sits down in there, and hopefully when we put the screw through, it lines up. I don't want that real tight yet because we need to measure this opening and make sure that it's set properly. So, so I've got a ruler here. If you have the actual wrench that comes with these, it's it's on the end, it just slips right in here, uh, and it's designed for um, measuring the distance. Like you just put it in and it sets it to the right distance. I don't have one of those. So uh, you'll need to look up what the appropriate distance is depending on what candle power you've got. Um, so we'll put this on top here. And on a 500 candle power model, the gap between the jet and the the J tube needs to be, technically it's 14.2 millimeters. I'm just gonna set it as close as I can to 14. A little bit awkward here. That's 15. 14 there, and we just tighten the screw and that locks it in. And now that we've got that locked in, we'll go ahead and measure again, and yep, that's, that's 14. Um, as these things wear out, as the orifice increases in size with usage and time, uh, it can get larger, uh, then you need to adjust this. The old ones, the original one here actually has a, a little flathead screw fitting on it and there's a butterfly valve inside and you can use that to fine tune it. 
Um, I have a feeling those those got stuck or went uh, went wonky, so they don't do that anymore. Um, you just have to adjust the height, and you need to look at the height for the candle power lantern you're working with. So that's all set properly. Make sure again it's tight. So we'll put our mixing chamber on now, and we'll screw on our ceramic nozzle. Again, these nozzles are consumables. You can buy a metal one. Uh, and that's that. So let's get a mantle out. I'm very tempted to use a cheap testing mantle. First, All right, all back together. Hopefully it works. Uh, Petromax 828 Rapid uh, upgraded 500 candle power. So we need to burn that mantle in. Um, we need to put fuel in here. We need to pump it up. We need to do all that stuff. Um, I am going to burn the mantle in, I think Coleman style and just use a match. Supposedly you can use the, the Rapid preheater to do that, um, but I don't trust it. So. Um, I'm going to fuel this up first and then we'll come back and I'll take the, the uh, center or the, the inner hood out, burn that mantle in or get it started and then we'll try lighting this up. All right, finally the fun part. Um, we're, we're pumped up to two bars. Um, it's off. We've got no leaks. That's good. No leaks here. We're ready to light it. Uh, the mantle is burned in actually to be truthful with you. You'll notice it's already been lit um, I filmed the first light up. This is the second light up uh, I firm that filmed the first light up and had technical difficulties uh, I think as the preheater hit, heated the generator uh, Some additional carbon that was still stuck in the Preston loop broke loose and it clogged up the tip uh, And it was way more than the cleaning needle could handle so I had to let it cool off I took the top off the generator or the carburetor and flushed kerosene through there until all the little bits of carbon were gone. So I think we're finally ready now. So I'll flip the rapid preheater lever down that will take the, the, the pip off of the nozzle and it will start making a kerosene vapor. You want to light it at this hole down here. I know it's tempting to stick something through here to light it, but if you try to light it up there, it'll just blow itself out. So I'm going to use a match because my lighter is getting flaky. Isn't that fun? Now that drains pressure quickly, so we need to start pumping.
pressure. We're close, but we'll top it up. And we're good to go. And this will run all evening on that pressure. Let me cut the lights out. So I think this will give a 237 or a 639 or um, even a 621 or 625 a run for its money, certainly with the brightness. Uh, I really like the Petromax mantles. They're definitely very nice. Um, so yeah, I'm really glad to see this thing running again. I wasn't sure if I'd actually do it or not. Um, but with the rebuild kit and a little time, it's running again and should run for years.